Do you know what it is to follow a flawed leader? Or just a leader? Have you followed a leader? Have you had uh, <clears throat> that kind of excitement? Do, do you know where you kind of remember the kind of, oh, wow, this, this person's amazing. This is the one I want to be like them. I want to follow them. I want to do what they're doing. Maybe you remember it in a small way from school. Do, do you know where there'd be a kind of a group <clears throat> mentality and they'd be a kind of leader of the pack person, the one who everybody, they said they'd do it and everyone else did do it. And um, Maybe you knew the floor in that way. You're like, oh, do we have to do whatever they're doing? Can't we just go and all do something else? Or maybe you've known it. Often we, we come across flawed leaderships in work, don't we? Do, do you know where... You, you're, you don't get to choose who your manager is or who's in charge, and you see their flaws. Maybe they've, maybe they've been excellent. Maybe they've had problems. Or maybe in a bigger way, do you know that experience of uh, just being excited about a politician? It doesn't happen very often, does it? But, you know, like, you just... I, I've known it once. We're just like, change is coming! This is really going to happen. This is going to be fantastic. And in my experience, it didn't work. Do you, do you know, it was, I stayed up till 5 o'clock in the morning waiting for the end of the vote, and I was incredibly excited and just was disillusioned as the years went by. Or perhaps you followed a philosopher. Do you know, people are quite keen. There's a very popular uh, uh, Jordan Peterson. He's very popular on, online at the moment. And people are going, we're going to follow him. He's fantastic. Or perhaps you've uh, explored other other faiths, other walks in life, and found a spiritual guru that's been very important to you and maybe flawed. Perhaps you've been in a church where there's been a flawed church minister or a fantastic church minister who's just <laughs> wonderful. This is a picture of Guru Swami Saraswati. He's in the news this week. He, uh, he's run this center called Agama yoga, it's on a gorgeous Thai island. Do you know where the sea's all clear and the green's all lush and everybody sleeps in a straw hut and lots of very rich people pay a fortune to fly over there and spend weeks with him and he's not in the news because of anything good. He's in the news because over the last 15 years he's been accused of lots of different sexual assaults. So you just imagine these hundreds of people who've followed him. Do you know? Loved him, been excited by his teaching, and it's been undermined, it's been flawed. I bet you recognize this guy. That's quite a scary face, I think. This is David Koresh. That's not his birth name. He changed his name to David and uh, then created a religion called the Davidians. A bit of an ego. And he's the guy at the center of the Waco Massacre. So oh, they set up the Mount Carmel Center, and hundreds of people came to him. They, they were following him. He was calling, telling them he was their Messiah, and there's lots of rumors of abuses, but they were never investigated because the ATF came to investigate the place, and there was a shootout with 10 killings, and then before they got in, 90, him and 89 of his followers committed suicide. Do you know, they wanted a leader, though, those people, didn't they? What were they thinking when they followed this leadership? And why do people keep falling for these things? Do you ask yourself that? Do you know? Because this is going on now. This has happened a lot in the past, and it's surely going to keep on going where people just really, really want to follow somebody, and they're so eager for it, maybe they're desperate for it, that they're willing to follow people who do horrible things. They're willing to put up with lots of dreadful things. Surely it must be that there's lots of people who want to be disciples, isn't it? There's lots of people who are searching for a discipline of life that will give them meaning, contentment, happiness, whatever it is that they're searching for that will fulfill their lives. There are people crying out for a leader, but they keep following the wrong leader. Jesus is the perfect leader. This is who we should want to follow. Jesus, if you want to be a disciple, follow the perfect leader. Don't keep going off looking for the truth elsewhere. Jesus is the perfect example of life. He's the perfect example of leadership. Jesus is the perfect person. 
He is worth being a disciple to. How wonderful would it have been? Can you imagine it? To have actually been with Jesus during his life on earth. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine being somebody that Jesus called out to when you're going about your daily business? Or being somebody that Jesus walked up to and healed? Or being a member of a crowd when Jesus is saying this beautiful, amazing, profound teaching and you're the one there lapping it up? Can you imagine actually being one of his close disciples where Jesus takes a personal interest in how you're developing? Where Jesus forgives your mistakes and helps you to grow into being his disciple? Imagine that. And I guess that's uh, part of the problem where Christians go bad, because every now and again they do, you know, Christians go bad. And one of the things that happens is that's what they want. They want this, this one-to-one connection. They want this being nurtured by a person, and that can, that can work, mentoring, discipling, but it's when they make that person more than Jesus. We should be led to Jesus, but instead we start following the person that we're, that we're asking for information about Jesus from. Do you know? We start with wanting to know Jesus, and then we start adoring or, or worshipping this person that we're following. Put Jesus first. Human leaders will always be flawed. Human leaders will always have faults. The best we can hope from a a human leader, a good human leader, is one who helps us closer to Jesus. Somebody as a stepping stone to be closer to Jesus. Put Jesus first. Jesus is the one that we are disciples to, and he is worth it. And Jesus wants you to be his disciple. We are here now in this church to be Jesus' disciples. And we mess it up. We all know we mess it up. We all know we make mistakes. We, all, we aren't saying, because we're disciples, we've reached it. We're perfect. Leave me alone. It's all going fine. We know we're going to fail in this. And we're all at different stages. Some here might not have decided to make the commitment to be a disciple of Jesus yet. You might be waiting on that. Some here have been a disciple a long time, and maybe you've become tired. Maybe you feel let down in it. Some here are in that first first flush of excitement and love and commitment and delight in knowing and following Jesus. We're at different stages. But our passage today shows us there can be no half measures. R.J. Karras said, Discipleship is not periodic volunteer work on one's own terms and at one's own convenience. I think that's sometimes how we see it. Discipleship is not a self-help class. You know, people are quite used to attending a class and they say, those bits of what you say are quite useful, I'll keep them. Those bits are rubbish, you can keep them for yourself. Do you know? It's not a pick and mix. It's not a club. Discipleship is not a club we join to make new friends and find new activities. Discipleship must be with our whole heart. And this is what Jesus is saying to his, the crowd when he's speaking. He turns to a large crowd in Luke chapter 14, 26, and he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. It's very strong, isn't it? Hate. All the people that everybody naturally loves. This whole crowd of people, there there must be amongst them a complete expectation. These are the people it's obvious to love. Hate your own life or you can't be my disciple. Why is he saying that? This must be shocking to these people. Do you know? A slap in the face. What? What's he saying? What does he want from us? What is he asking from us? But we know that Jesus has already made abundantly clear, hugely clear, that there is no place for hate in his teaching. It's in this gospel, just a few chapters back, in chapter 6. Jesus says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, 
pray for those who mistreat you. There is no room for hate. Let's not make a mistake. Do not go home and be nasty to your families, okay? If there's nothing else you remember, don't be nasty to your families, okay? There's no place for this. When somebody hates you, be good to them. When they curse you, when they're rude to you, when they're nasty to you, bless them. When they mistreat you, pray for them. Love them. What Jesus is saying, what Jesus is meaning, is that Jesus is your first priority. If you want to be a disciple, Jesus is your first priority. If you want to be his disciple, Jesus is your first loyalty. If you want to follow him, Jesus is your first love. Or, you're not his disciple. And that's a challenge for you today, this morning. At whichever stage you're at in your faith, in your relationship with Jesus, is Jesus still your first loyalty, your first love, your first priority? But I promise you, looking at what Jesus says here, If you do this, and you are a true disciple of Jesus, if you put Jesus first, you will be a better father or mother. You will be a better husband or wife, daughter or son, sister or brother, if Jesus is your first love, your first priority, your first loyalty. How do we do this? How do we be good disciples? How do we grow as disciples? We love him. Worship him. Adore him in your praise. Grow in your love for Jesus. We learn of Jesus. Read his word. Make friends with people who love Jesus so that you can be close to their love for Jesus. Pray to him. Speak to him. Listen to him. Grow in him. Get to know Jesus. That's how you love and that is how you grow as a disciple. And take that... And look for his will in your life and follow it. Hold nothing back. After Jesus has told them that they have to hate him or be, to, to be his disciples, he says, and, ev- and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. He's calling on us to take up our cross and follow him. And we can link this with the five chapters before where he also talks about taking up his cross. He says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow him. Do not hold part of your life back from Jesus. I was once called to visit a lawyer. This isn't a joke. There's, there's no lawyer joke. I used to tell lawyer jokes in church, but then I found I hurt their feelings because they're very sensitive people, lawyers. So no lawyer jokes. I was once called to visit a real lawyer. He was a lovely man. He was a part of the church, and he was struggling. He was struggling with lots of things in his life. And he wanted to sit with me and talk to me, and his main question was, what is God's will for my life? Now, he was a really nice guy, and he'd been coming to church with his family for years, but he never took communion. He deliberately did not take communion because he wasn't sure. He wasn't sure about Jesus. He liked being in church, he liked being part of the community, but he hadn't made a faith commitment. So that made the answer really clear. God's will for him, like God's will for you, is that you deny yourself and follow him. Then I gave him a $1,200 bill. It was a half hour conversation. (laughs) We can't hold part of ourselves back. We can't half follow Jesus. Jesus is saying this. You can't half follow me. You've got to be wholehearted to be in. There's no half measures. We don't get to keep part of our life away from the will of God. Do you know, I think we often would like to 
keep some pockets to ourselves. We want to keep this part of work away from the will of God because we won't be able to do it if, if we have to follow God's will in it. Do you know? We want to keep it for ourselves and do it our own way. We want to keep some of these relationships apart from God. I'm, I follow Jesus all day long, but on Friday night, I'm just going to go and ha- be different in those relationships. We want to keep our holidays or our hobbies away from God, and we can't keep part back. We have to look for God's will in every part of our lives. And God isn't necessarily going to want to take away from you these things. But Jesus' demand, the demand that we see in what he's saying here, is that we seek God's will in all areas of our lives, each and every area of our lives. And maybe when we do that, we will find that some things are unhealthy. And it will be good for us to know that and move away from those Maybe when we do that, we'll find ways to make those things that we're doing healthy, and they will be so much better, do you know? And we will find so much holy joy in them. And here is a sign that Jesus is the perfect leader. He doesn't want you if you don't want him. He doesn't want you to half take this on. He's not like a politician saying, tell me how I can change to win your vote. Tell me what I should say to be attractive to the most people. Jesus calls on you to be sure before you start or don't start. Like somebody putting up a building. Construction season is still going, isn't it? They've been tearing them down and putting them up. You don't start putting up a building unless you're sure you complete it. Jesus talks of a man putting up a tower, and he says everyone will make fun of him if he builds half the tower but then doesn't have the funds to complete it. This is how he puts it. For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule ridicule you, saying... This person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Count the cost before you start. Jesus isn't just saying, sign up, sign up, sign up, don't worry, no commitment, 0% interest, just sign up and we'll work out the rest later. He's saying, no, sit down and consider carefully. He says it's like a king going to war. This king is about to be attacked by 20,000 men, and he only has 10,000 men. He will sit down and consider carefully and work out if he's got a chance to win. And if he hasn't, he'll sue for peace. This is how Jesus puts it. If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. This is strong stuff. Jesus wants us, but Jesus wants us to do this properly, giving up everything, everything. Now, there's this interesting slight difference between the two parables, the two small parables. The first parable, the one about building the tower, the guy's got the choice whether to build or not. Do you know? Sit down and consider this. And basically, if he realizes he doesn't have the funds for the whole tower, he doesn't have to build at all, do you know? He can just wait a bit. So the question from the first parable is, can you afford to follow Jesus? Make this choice carefully. The question from the second parable is slightly different, because the king with 10,000 men is going to be attacked whether he likes it or not. The 20,000 men are coming. His choice is, shall I fight or shall I negotiate? So the question we're being asked by Jesus in the second parable is, can you afford to ignore Jesus? Can you afford to ignore Jesus' demands? We come to Jesus with our whole hearts. We come to Jesus with our minds. We come to Jesus with our whole being. He calls us. He chooses us but he also gives us this chance to make the choice, to weigh the options. He wants us to truly and wholly commit to him and then to truly and wholly live for him. Now, maybe you're thinking, whoa there, 
I'm not coming back to this church. They don't want me if I'm not totally committed. Do you know what? Maybe if you're really sure you don't want to ever totally commit, you're right. But maybe you just need more time. And you're welcome to be here thinking about this. But this is what we're aiming at. We're aiming at being totally committed disciples of the best and truest and most perfect leader, Jesus Christ. This is the point that we should all be aiming for, where we say, I love you, Jesus. I will follow you, Jesus, no matter what the cost, and there could be a great cost. I will deny myself for you, Jesus. I will take up my cross, and I will follow you. You are God's creation. You are free. You are chosen. You are called, and you have choices to make. Will you be a disciple of Jesus? Will you give up all for him? Will you bring him into all aspects of your life and follow him? I'll just finish with a quote from Billy Graham. Salvation is free, but discipleship costs everything we have.